Welcome to Sports Connections with David Smale, a podcast that brings fun and interesting connections throughout sports. As an author and sports journalist, David has been interviewing fascinating people in sports for more than 40 years. Now here's your host, David Smale. Known as the Nigerian Nightmare because defenders would have nightmares about having to tackle him, Christian Okoye entered the NFL as a second round pick of the Kansas City Chiefs in 1987. He wasn't exactly a traditional second round pick. He came to the U.S. from Nigeria at age 21 and enrolled at Azusa Pacific University as a track athlete. He didn't play football until he was 23. He didn't like the game at first, but proved to be a a star very quickly. His speed, 4.45 in the 40 and his size, 6'1", 260, made him a handful for defenses. As a member of the Chiefs, he led the NFL in rushing in 1989 with 1,480 yards. Knee injuries cut his career short, and he retired after six seasons. But he was selected to two Pro Bowls, and his 4,897 yards still ranked fourth on the Chiefs' all-time list. Christian, welcome to Sports Connections. Well, thank you for having me. I'm going to make you one correction. Okay. It was 4440, not 445. Not 445. Okay, well, we get that correct. Correct. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I I never played linebacker, but I could just imagine somebody your size coming at me that quick, and I would just go, no, I'm out. <laughs> so talk yeah. about coming to the United States. What brought you to the U.S., and why did you choose Azusa Pacific? Well, I chose, as, first of all, I chose Azusa Pacific because a friend of mine was going there. He came out a year before I did. And um, basically, um, coming out to uh, the Pacific and America uh, is a way of uh, kind of looking for something better than what I had already in Nigeria, uh, trying to improve life, uh, more competition in track and field, which I was doing at the time. Um, so all those, you know, moved me to want to come out and um, go to school out here. Okay, and just opportunity for the U.S. in general, and that was the the best way to get to that opportunity? Yes, the best way to get that opportunity is go to school. And um, I knew that uh, the schools out here have a a lot more better coaches and equipment and things Mm -hmm. like that to uh, allow me to improve to the level that I um, Mm -hmm. I, want to improve to. Sure. Now, um, I will get to your own personal history quite a bit, but I want to talk to you about your reaction to a recent announcement that uh, Azusa Pacific is dropping football. That had to that had to hit you like a Nigerian nightmare coming at you. <laughs> yeah, they called me and told me they were going to make the announcement. So, um, you know, I don't blame them because... Uh, <laughs> In these days, uh, when you have this pandemic going on already, they're having some trouble um, financially uh, mm-hmm. for, the, for the program. And then uh, coronavirus came and hit. Uh, nothing is moving. Uh, so a lot of schools are making their decisions. And, uh, yeah. You know, my old school, Azusa Pacific, is one of them. But it's still got to be tough. I mean, there's, they had a pretty good history. I've got, uh, I've got a good friend who played there besides you. Uh, it's still got to be tough to know that, you know, no longer will be there be football players at Azusa Pacific with a chance at the NFL. Yes, it will be tough. You know, we, uh, for 55 years, we've had a a football program there. And, um, you know, it's, it's always a big deal when we all come together for the homecoming, seeing your old uh, uh, teammates and roommates and, people that you, you, you went to school with. Uh, but now we're not able to, to do that for football. Um, we can still do that for other sports, but uh, probably not the same people will come back for that. Yeah, <laughs> or, yeah exactly. You know, yeah, so it's going to be difficult. It, it will be hard, but, you know, uh, what are you going to do? Spend money that you don't have? Yeah. So that, I think they made the decision they had to make. Sure, sure. Yeah, the the first time I ever knew anything about or heard anything about Christian Okoye was, I don't remember if it was the Senior Bowl or the East-West Shrine game, but I saw it on ESPN and there was this big bruising running back who just tore up the field against a bunch of Division I players. 
as a lifelong Chiefs fan, I thought we need to get that guy. And <laughs> sure enough, we got that guy and I'm thrilled yeah. about that. But talk about the fact you didn't like football when you first came over to the U.S. Why didn't you like it? And how long did it take for you to start liking football? Well, then I didn't like it because I didn't know anything about it. Okay. I we didn't have football in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody talked about football in Nigeria. And even when you talk about football, you're talking about soccer. Right. So right. I had never seen the game. When I came out here, it was strange to me that people were running to each other all the time and uh, go home at night, you have headaches and bruises and things like that. I was asking myself, what kind of stupid game is that? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so I had no interest until I was disappointed by, by Nigeria for not taking me to the Olympics in 84. So I decided I'm gonna try something, you know? And um, uh, friends have been telling me you should play football because they saw my size and speed. And, uh, but, I keep avoiding that. Um, my first, you know, thought was to play soccer, but you know, I grew up playing soccer, but I was so big. Yeah, I can't run around with the little guys playing soccer. <laughs> so I decided I'm going to try the, the game football. So once yeah. once once you tried it, uh, did you like it pretty quickly, or did it, it take a little while to grow on you? I never I never liked football up until. You know, maybe my second half of my career with the Chiefs. Huh. You know, yeah, I never liked it. I, I, when I started playing at my school, I was, um, I stayed with it because my coaches and friends encouraged me to stay on. They told me that I was doing good. I should stay and play. You know, my old track and field coach, Terry Franson, he used to say to me, Christian, why don't you give it a week? Why don't you give it two weeks? Every time I come back to him, he will tell me the same thing. And then towards the end of the season, he says, you know, the season is over. You, you might as well finish it. Yeah. And then the following year will come around. He says, Christian, you should think about going back and trying to play again because he did so well last year, you know? So that's the way I stayed with the game. And uh, coming to the Chiefs, uh, it was kind of like the same thing, but I ran into a lot of good people, good, good people, good coaches that cared for me, just like uh, my coaches at Azusa cared for me. Um, uh, Billy Matthews was the running back coach at the time, um, mm -hmm. former, formerly coach for San Francisco. And um, you know, I love Bill Matthews. He's passed on right now, but he was a good man who took me in as a son. And uh, also my teammates at the time, uh, they, they all helped me out. Okay. Hey. Was there a point where you all of a sudden realized I'm better at this than, than, you know, I thought I would be, or I'm better at this than a lot of the guys around me. I could actually make a living running into or running over people. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, because my dad didn't want me playing football. I, you know, when I tried to convince him, I said, dad, if I play this game, I can make enough money to, you know, support the family and stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so that was the only time I thought about the money part of it. But the rest of the time, I was just trying to kind of uh, uh, build up courage to stay in the game because of it was such a strange one from my culture, my upbringing, you see? Yeah. What, what was it, you said you didn't like it until the latter half of your professional career. When you ended up liking it, what was... What was what you liked the most? Was it looking down at the defender after you ran over him? Uh, what, what did you like most about the game once you finally developed a like for it? Well, I developed a relationship with all my teammates and uh, developed a relationship with the city. And uh, I felt like Kansas City is my home. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so every time uh, um, the football came to my head, it's like, yeah, that's Kansas City. That's, that's home. That's my people. Okay. Uh, so about playing the game, it's kind of like if, you, if you're in a family and you're doing something that your family love, loves you when you do it, it's kind of like you're pleasing them, you're making them feel good, you know? So, and my teammates, they're just incredible. The support that I received from them and um, how they treated me was just you know, out of sight, you know? And um, that was, those are the reasons why 
um, I became more um, uh, interested in the game and liking it more and more. Mm -hmm. Are there any teammates that you want to mention specifically, maybe, you know, a best friend on the team or somebody that really inspired you? Are there any that stand out for you? Well, you know, some of my friends, Barry Ward, Jonathan Hayes in particular, um, I, I still talk to those guys till today. And then, of course, uh, Steve DeBerg, my quarterback, um, you know, we're still good friends. I spent Thanksgiving with him this year. Wow. Uh, yeah, so he's a good friend. You know, people like that, people that, um, that you become almost family-like with. Um, uh, those people just, you know, took me in as uh, one of their own and, uh, you know, supported me. When I think of Steve DeBerg, I, I think of him playing with a broken finger. And if I remember correctly, he had to throw the football like this with his finger up in the air because he had broken it. Uh, but <laughs> he was he as much fun as a teammate, as he appeared to be from, you know, those of us in the media got to talk to him at, you know, press conferences and stuff like that, but we didn't get to know him like you, get, you did as a teammate. Was he as, as much fun as a teammate as he appears? Uh, he was even more fun as a teammate than, uh, you know, you guys saw. Uh, huh. He's a great guy, fun loving guy. He loves holidays, he loves Halloween. He always dresses up. When uh, we would play together at the Chiefs, he would throw a huge party at his house. He would convert his old house as a hunting house. Uh, <laughs> Halloween. I mean, it, it's incredible what he did. He spent so much money hiring people to stand over there like a statue. When you when you come up before you get into the house, they move and kind of scare you. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it, he did all those, and then of course uh, the food and drinks and all that. And, uh, no, he's he's a uh, he's a lot of fun. All right, since you're talking about alter ego, shall we call it? Um, I want to talk to you about your nickname. Um, I, I've known you not well, but I've known you for a number of years, and nightmare doesn't fit. You know, <laughs> you, you are you are one of the nicest people I I know in sports. Did you like the nickname Nigerian Nightmare? I didn't mind it. I didn't mind it. But, you know, I think it's just a football nickname, you know, on the field. Uh, it wasn't meant for it to be outside, outside the football field. So, um, so I welcomed it because it fit so well. Okay. All right. Talk about playing for Marty and the fact that, uh, you know, the, today's Chiefs are all about the passing game. Uh, but but Marty Ball was all about featuring big bruising running backs, uh, a stout defense, and the passing game was almost an afterthought. Talk about playing football for Marty with Marty Ball. Well, mainly in those days, that's really what football was all about. You have great running backs, you know, playing at a time. Uh, Eric Dickerson, Marcus Allen, Barry Sanders, and many others. Uh, so the league ran the football most of the time, um, mm -hmm. and especially the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, so it's, and you know, to compare it to today, today NFL is a passing league, right. you know? Yeah, they throw the ball a lot. And I am so surprised that they can fit in about 85 plays in a game. I mean, offensively, 85 plays in a game. At the time, if we, if we run 55, 60 plays, you know, to me, it's a lot. Yeah. Which half of it is me running the ball. But um, today is just, you know, passing. The, all the teams pass a, a lot. Uh, but I'm so glad the game is changing. It's changing to um, into something that uh, people can survive. When I played, <laughs> it was a gladiator sports. Yeah. Would you have, would you have been successful in today's game where the, the running back has to be able to catch the ball out of the backfield, has to be able to pick up blitzes, protect the quarterback. Would you have had, would you have been as successful had you played in this generation rather than the last one? I think so. I think so. I think I would have been successful, you know, even as big as I was. Um, yeah, I will, I would have been able to do it. Could you catch the ball out of the backfield? <laughs> I did when I played. They didn't throw it to me much. 
you know, because uh, I run the ball so much. Yeah. But um, if you remember my second year in the league, I caught the ball. I caught like 24, 25 balls, which is like maybe third on the team. Yeah. So, um, yes. Yeah, that's quite a bit back in that in that time. Now it's just like, oh, they're kind of an afterthought. But back in the day, in your day, that was that was quite a bit. I want to yeah. talk to you about some of your uh, your highlights in the NFL. Who was the toughest defender you ever had to face? Um, it was Richard Dent. Um, Richard Dent, I remember went to Chicago to play them. It was so cold. And um, uh, it was third and one. The play was third and one, and uh, a dive play was, was called to my left. And um, I, I had everything in my mind to make the first down. And uh, of course, the defenses were looking at me, knowing that I was going to yeah. get the ball. And as I was sprinting towards that first down, and Richard Dent was coming, and both of us would hit each other and kind of bounced um, away from each other. I got my first down, but I know that we both knocked each other out. Um, yeah. and because I when I was heading to my huddle, Richard was following me. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember a, a play uh, with with Steve Atwater in Denver, and you had to play Steve Atwater twice a year. Well, yeah. How tough? How tough was he? He was a he was a great uh, a good football player. You know, I mean uh, that one play that everybody talked talks about. He, uh, it was on uh, Monday Night Football, and he mm. was my. And um, he just caught me, caught me, and um, you know, people are making a big deal out of it, always talking about it. But it's a football play, and uh, he did what he had to do, and he caught me off guard. Yeah, and from my from my perspective, being a Chiefs fan, I'm always going to look at the positive side for the Chiefs. You didn't have your momentum going; he wouldn't have been able to stop you like that had you both been going at, at full momentum, exactly. you were just getting, getting started and he was coming from the backfield, defensive backfield when, when he hits you. Uh, yeah. But with, was he, was he always, I mean, obviously he got a lot of publicity for that one uh, and it's still played on NFL films and things like that. But was he tough all the time? Was he one where you go, okay, I got to make sure I know where I think he was four, number 45. I got to know where, no, he was 27, wasn't he? 20, he was number 27. 27, yeah. Okay. I got to know where number 27 is? No. I, I, the person that we were uh, game planning for was actually Dennis Smith. Dennis Smith, if you remember him, was the mm -hmm. guy who was the free safety. Um, he was the guy that we were always game planning for. You know, um, to me, uh, he would get you because he was a big guy too. Yeah. He would get you. He filled in the gap a lot, a lot more often than Steve Howard did. You know, yeah. So that one play actually, you know, raised his profile up. Yeah, and it doesn't, doesn't hurt to be mic'd as as Chiefs fans know from the uh, the first person being mic'd in an NFL game, Hank Stram. You know, we have a whole a whole lexicon of terms that Hank Stram came up with because NFL films mic'd him. So, yeah. Um, who was your favorite team to play against? Oh man, I I think it was the Raiders. I think it was the Raiders because uh, they always talk, 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 and you know, uh, the Raiders at the time we beat them all the time, and uh, they always think the the number one team in the league, you know? <laughs> so we have fun beating them all the time. <laughs> and those of us who grew up Raiders fans absolutely love that. I, I shared in the in the book I did on the history of the Chiefs <laughs> that, uh, you know, growing up in Kansas City in the 1960s, uh, my parents would tell my brother and me, you know, hate is not a virtue that's allowed in this house, you know, it's not a Christian virtue. We, do, you are not allowed to hate, except the Raiders. We were allowed to hate the Raiders. So, anytime the Chiefs played the Raiders, didn't matter which team was good and which one was bad. We always enjoyed uh, beating the Raiders. And so, I'll speak for all my fellow longtime Chiefs fans. Thank you very much for putting them in their place as often as you did. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs>
So was it hard? I know that knee injuries slowed you considerably. Was it hard for you to walk away from football? No, it wasn't hard at all because, you know, if you remember, I, football wasn't in my culture when I was growing up. So right. it, it didn't hit me as hard as it would, it would hit those guys who started in Pop Warner age, you know, and they never, never, ever missed football season game and so on. So when they leave the game, it, it, it hits them hard. But myself, no, it wasn't. I was actually happy to leave. You okay. know, when, I, when they put me on the injury reserve, I, I walked up to the coach and told him, I said, I'm going I'm to leave. I'm, I'm done. He says, oh, you're too young. You still have four or five years. I said, no, I'm, I'm done, coach. Thank you. Okay. And so uh, that was in, if my math is correct, 92, 93. What have you done in the almost 30 years uh, since retiring from football? Well, I, um, uh, in 1990, I had my uh, foundation opened up for the kids. And then um, I also bought a small company that uh, made protein powder. And I owned that for about 14, 15 years. I uh, then got rid of it. And um, now uh, I run the California Sports Hall of Fame and uh, manage my uh, foundation. Okay, and we'll get into the foundation here in just a little bit. I want to. I definitely want to follow up on that. Um, do you follow the Chiefs closely? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I know you come to Kansas City periodically. How often do you get to see games in person, and, and how much is that a part of your regular uh, Sunday or Monday night or Thursday night uh, game plan? I watch all the Chiefs games. I, um, I go and see them in person about half of the games they play in the season, about eight. Okay, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty devoted. Um, what, what do you think of this year's team? And, and by the time this airs, the regular season will have ended uh, preparing for the playoffs. Just what do you think of this year's team and, and how far do you think they can go? I think they, they can go to the Super Bowl and win it. I think this year's team is much better than last year's team. You know, uh, this year they can do anything they want, actually, offensively. Um, at times we have to tighten up the defense, but uh, offensively, I think they are much better than they were last year. And I think they can win the Super Bowl again. I don't see any team beating them in the Super Bowl. Yeah, I, I've said from the beginning of the season, there's one team in the NFL this year that can beat the Chiefs, and that's the Chiefs. They have to do something. They have to make a, a you know a bad mistake at a critical time in order not to win. I, I agree with you. Um, do you see a player in the NFL who could be the next Christian Okoye? No, because they don't play players uh, that big anymore. So... <laughs> But I tell you what, our rookie running back, Clyde, man, I love the way he runs. I love the way he plays the game. And uh, uh, it's more, much more compact to the ground than I was. Yeah, yeah quite but, a bit. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, but um, I love the way he runs. I like, I like his style. And just talk, uh, anybody I talk to who's involved with football, I have to ask this question. What are your, what's your opinion of Patrick Mahomes? Have you ever seen anybody quite like that? The only person I can compare him to was um, is uh, Joe Montana when he, he played. Uh, Joe Montana is so carefree when he's on the field, and um, uh, Mahomes is even more so. I, people ask me this question all the time: What? How do you describe him? I describe him as, you know, a kid in the backyard just playing with his friends, you know, yeah. running around, finding a way to beat his friends. And that's exactly what he does. Have, has there been a play where you're watching and you say, wait a minute, I played football. That's not possible. Have you ever had one of those where you just, you know, you're just amazed by what he can do? Uh, no, no. After watching him for two years now, shoot, I'm not amazed anymore. I just expect <laughs> him to do the same. <laughs> what, what's your favorite Patrick Mahomes play? Oh gosh, um, I will say in the Super Bowl, that long pass to Tyreek Hill, that, that changed the Super Bowl for us because after that, we scored, you know, 
we score enough touchdowns to beat the 49ers when they thought they won the Super Bowl already. Yeah. All right. We're going to wrap up with this. Uh, and this is your, your chance to give us the commercial, the pit, the sales pitch, uh, all of those things. Talk about the Christian Akwe Foundation. What's your, what's your focus? How can people get involved? Where do they go to send donations? It's the, the floor is yours to talk about the Christian Akwe Foundation. Well, it, uh, Christian Okoye Foundation, if you go to okoyefoundation.org or you can go to christianokoye.com, uh, it's all the same uh, website. Okay. Uh, you can donate there and your donation goes to my efforts to work with the Nigerian kids. Um, you know, doing the same things that I did in America from 1990 to about four years ago, we, we host a... Uh, we hosted um, uh, sports clinics for the underprivileged kids every summer. And um, some of those kids that we, uh, we had in the camps, we usually invite uh, kids from group homes, foster homes, and things like that. And uh, a lot of them are grown men and women now with families. And every time I go to events, people walk up to me and shake my hands and say, thank you so much for what you did when I was young. I was in a group home. Now I have a family of my own, my wife, my kids, and you know, I'm, I'm a firefighter now or a police officer. And, I mean, those are the things that we promoted because uh, we had another program that we did in the Christmas time where we invite firefighters, we invited uh, police officers and professionals to come and visit with the kids. And um, you know, it worked, it worked. So just giving the kids the mind to think beyond where they are at the, at the moment, you know, open their minds to other things, tell them they can be anything they want to be if, it, if they work hard. And then we bring in different professionals to come in mm -hmm. and speak to the kids. And, uh, you know, it worked. That's got to be very rewarding to, to be able to impact so many lives like that. Yes, yes, it is rewarding. I mean, uh, just in Nigeria right now, the kids that are involved in my program, uh, they sent me messages on social media, you know, telling me how things are going, how they're enjoying themselves. You know, I mean, every time you open a kid's mind to think for themselves, that's all you have to do. They follow it and they think and it, they become excited. You know, it keeps them away from trouble. And what if somebody wants to be involved, <clears throat> excuse me, other than just donating? Is, are there ways for people here in America, especially, to get involved with your foundation in a, in a well, active way besides donations? Yeah, well, you know, uh, we, have a, we have a program out here in uh, California. We, we do a 5K and 10K run, which is on the same website. They will find it. Mm -hmm. um, and then in Kansas City, we do a roast every year. Um, uh, we host our, our roast at the uh, Harris Casino at okay. the Voodoo Lounge. We do it around uh, April time, towards the end of April, on the same weekend as the draft. We do it that Sunday. Okay. Uh, this year, we plan to roast uh, Dante Hall. Um, we're going to roast him last this. 2020, but uh, it had to be postponed. So he's going to be the one that will roast in April, April 25th. Hopefully things will be open by then. And uh, if you want to get involved, that's where you go to the, um, to the website and you can uh, uh, get you a ticket from the website and uh, attend. All right. Sounds good. Well, Christian, it's always a pleasure to visit with you. Good to connect with you in this way. And I just thank you for being a part of it. All right. Thank you, my man. You take care of yourself. Merry Christmas. You too. Thanks for listening to Sports Connections with David Smale. Make sure to subscribe, follow, and rate the show from your favorite podcast platform. You can learn more about David Smale and his work by visiting davidsmalebooks.com. Don't forget to join us weekly for new episodes. Until next time. <laughs>